A golden beacon that lures all who aspire to greatness in the greatest game of all, rugby league. From Wayne Head's first victory in 1968 through the 1970s when the East Tigers won the medal three times in a decade. To another Tiger Cub in 1984, a man who polled more votes than any who went before him. Here goes to Cavill Hugh. Hugh turns it back inside. Way to Cavill Hugh. Over, up and down again and he's in for the try. Tonight from the magnificent presidential ballroom of Brisbane's Crest International Hotel, one of the glittering array of stars gathered here will be named the 18th winner of the Rothmans gold medal for rugby league. Here now are your hosts for the evening, Pat Welsh and Peter Mears. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good evening to you all and welcome to the presentation of the most prestigious individual award in rugby league in this state. Pete, welcome to you. And Thanks, of course, Pat. the Rothmans gold medal is not the only talking point on league lips this week, is it? Certainly isn't. Winner Manly against South in the grand final on Sunday at Lang Park once again. And we're going to talk to the two coaches later in the show. But that's not the main reason we're here. It certainly isn't. The Rothmans medal will be presented to the best and fairest player in the A-grade Brisbane Premiership competition. But this year, an innovation that will be welcomed by all concerned with the greatest game of all. The medal count has been extended to include Queensland and Australian representative matches played within Australia. Yes, Pat, the judging, as in previous years, is done by the A-grade and uh, international and representative referees, and the points are awarded on a 3-2-1 basis. And with me is one of Brisbane's top referees, Eddie Wood. Eddie, when you're judging Rothman's medal points, uh, what do you look for? Well, after the game, uh, touch judges myself and like other referees we have a talk about the game and who stood out in our minds um, after that we analyze whether he's the best player and fairest or whether he's just the best and we go from there if he's just the best well then we look for if he did things wrong in the game but if he is also best and fairest that's when we go three two one down the line well thanks eddie and best of luck for the grand final thank you back to you pat eddie ward and in fact all the referees involved in the vote have the final say who collects those valuable points and needless to say their decision is gospel a statement that will come as uh, no surprise to many of our players in the audience this evening the referees votes are kept sealed throughout the year opened only after premiership fixtures have ended and then counted under the supervision of the state registrar general mr keith redmond for that once again we must thank thank him for his help and diligence As mentioned earlier this evening, a new rule has been introduced to give our Australian and Queensland representatives a better opportunity to compete for the medal. This innovation means that when an Australian or state representative team is playing overseas, for example the Kangaroos Tour of New Zealand this year, all voting on club matches at home will be suspended for the first two club fixtures. As a result, votes were not counted in the club competition for the 23rd and 30th of June, as during that time the Aussies were doing battle with the Kiwis. It goes without saying that any players found guilty by a judiciary committee for any misconduct charge in representative or club fixtures are ineligible for the award. The Rothmans Medal is an award for playing skill, sportsmanship and adherence to the rules. And as such, the winner is always distinguished far beyond the field of play. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce a man who has and continues to do so much for sport in this state the Queensland State Manager for Rothmans of Pall Mall, Mr Des Hancock. The Deputy Premier of Queensland, the Honourable Bill Gunn, Alderman Denver Beanland, representing the Lord Mayor, the Minister for Health, Honourable Brian Austin, the Chairman of the Queensland Rugby League, Mr. Ron McAuliffe, OBE, Chairman of the Brisbane Division of the Queensland Rugby League, Mr. Bill Hunter, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. You may notice that my voice is not quite what it normally is. Uh, it's mainly because that I have just spent a weekend in Townsville at the Winfield Foley Shield with the retiring Chairman of the Queensland Rugby League, Mr. Ron McAuliffe. I say retiring, not in the sense that uh, he is in any way shy or conservative, but only in the sense that uh, 
Ron is relinquishing his position as chairman of the Queensland Rugby League at the end of this month. A situation which I think is most sad, but uh, nevertheless, I guess all good things come to an end. And I know that Ron won't be far away anyway from the Queensland Rugby League in the years to come. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this, the 18th presentation of the Rothmans Rugby League Gold Medal. And I'm sure that, as in the uh, previous 17 years, tonight's winner will prove to be a great asset to the great game of rugby league. That leads me on to the fact that we do have many of our previous winners here this evening, and to those uh, fellows, I particularly welcome them, because uh, I don't think there's anyone amongst them who hasn't proved to be of great value to the game, and uh, to those previous winners, a particularly warm welcome. To the ref... <coughs> To Mr Stan Scamp, uh, the President of the Brisbane Rugby League Referees, uh, particularly welcome to you Stan and to all the guys here tonight because uh, to your fellows falls the onerous task of awarding votes. Uh, and while a lot of people don't agree with you at the time, I think it invariably turns out that, that at least in awarding these votes, your judgment can hardly be queried. I'd just like to say that the race for the Winfield 1985 Premiership has now got down to two teams. And coincidentally, the two teams in last year's final, that is South and uh, Winner Manly, happen to be the finalists in this year's uh, coming grand final. Uh, who knows? Uh, there are a lot of people, I think particularly at Table 8, who are hoping that last year's result will be repeated. But I know that Wayne Bennett and his boys think uh, that that may not be the case. But to Des Morris and his charges, and to Wayne Bennett and his team, congratulations to both of you for getting there. Uh, we wish you both the best of luck, and uh, I'm sure it'll be a great grand final. But however, the real reason for being here tonight is to honour once again a great player, whom I'm sure will go down on the annals, annals of uh, rugby league, has been another worthy winner of a Rothmans gold medal. And uh, for that reason, we have asked the retiring chairman of the Queensland Rugby League to make that announcement a little later on. So I don't wish to hold up proceedings any further, but uh, to thank you all for being in attendance, thank you for your attention, and I'm sure, like me, you look forward a little later on to hearing the winner of the 1985 medal. Thanks, Des. And I'm sure all of us in the room tonight will echo the sentiments about uh, Ron McAuliffe's fantastic contribution to the code in this state. <laughs> this year, 91 players were ruled eligible for the medal. Of those 91 players, the top 22 point scorers we will show you on our scoreboard. They are in alphabetical order. Jeff Bagnell from Norths, the brilliant South's fullback Gary Belcher, another fullback Valley skipper Michael Booth, Wynnum, Queensland and Australian forward Greg Dowling, another fullback, well at least he started the season there, Tim Dwyer from Brothers, undoubtedly one of the real finds of 1985, South's non-stop second rower John Elias, Brothers, the only club never to have won the medal, have two representatives on board one, the second is live wire halfback Henry Foster. And like brothers, the Seagulls also two names on board one. Their second is also a part of that feared Wynnum pack. He's Ian French. On board two, Redcliffe's first representative in the final medal count is tough Redcliffe forward Peter Griffiths. The fullbacks and halfbacks obviously caught the referee's eyes this year from Valley's Ross Henrik. The next name probably comes as a little surprise to most league followers. It was no little surprise, really. The winner of last year's medal by a record margin, an always consistent Cavill Q. Another of this season's real finds and part of the Valley's lineup which kept everybody honest in 85, Mark Hone. From Brothers, the man who brought the league crowds to their feet more than once this year, electrifying fullback Joe Kilroy. And hailing from Pat's old stomping ground of Bundaberg, Valley's winger Les Kiss. Yet another halfback, this time from the Western Suburbs Panthers, one of Brisbane's hardiest rugby league footballers, 
Kevin Langer. And to complete forward two, the man who manages to mix superb attack with tireless defence, Brett LeMann. And from board three, the man now fondly known as the Emperor of Lang Park, Queensland and Australian captain, Wally Lewis. <laughs> from Devil's Country at Bishop Park, Trevor Lucas. It's great to see the boys from the baller room acknowledged so frequently tonight. Mel Meninga may have arrived late on the scene after setting fire to those frozen fields of England, but he has obviously impressed the referees during his stint back at Souths. On his own admission, 84 was a bit patchy for South's Mark Meskell, but boy, hasn't he made his impressions on this year's Winfield Cup, and I think you'll agree he's had a huge role in pushing the Magpies into this year's grand final. And two more forwards wrap up the final 22 players for tonight's Rothmans gold medal count. They are Bill Ross from Wests, and from Brothers, Danny Staines. Incidentally, all eight Brisbane clubs are represented in the final countdown. Souths, Valleys and Brothers having four players each. Defending Premiers, Winner Manly have three. Norths, East and West, two each, while the Redcliffe Dolphins have one. I suppose at this, the business end of the season, many of the efforts of those players not represented in the semi-final teams tend to be forgotten. We believe their contributions to this marvellous 1985 season of rugby league shouldn't be allowed to fade. And we have put this compile together of some of the tries of 85. Jarvis, as John Rebo has to do some running of affairs in back play, having lost his shoe as it comes to Chris Close. Close trying to get past Ferguson, got up to Shearer, then it goes away to Murray. Murray gets it away to Bobby Lindner. Lindner will go in and score. That's a great try. Queen's Lindner back in business. Some of the best tries were scored at the outside grounds. The best individual effort, in our opinion, was by brothers dynamic Joe Kilroy against Norths at Bishop Park. Right from the kickoff, Joe ran 80 metres to score to bring back memories of his brilliant effort for Norths, ironically, in the 1980 Grand Final. Beating man after man with swerve, strength and pace, there was no stopping Smoke and Joe. To rival that effort, South's Gary Belcher turned in a spectacular effort against Redcliffe at Davies Park. Retrieving a kick, almost on his own line, long-striding Gary spotted a gap in the Dolphins' defence, pinned back his ears and ran. He almost did it on his own, but in typical unselfish fashion, positioned Eddie Muller, who strolled over for the easiest of tries. One of the best team tries also came from the Magpies against Easts at Langlands Park. Meninga ran wide, back inside to Belcher, then to Muller backing up, and finally, the big man bobs up again for a classic try near the posts. David Brooks making the initial mistake. The in the world for the One by Queensland. Colin Scott picks on the first tackle, but Dale Shearer. He went straight past the break. Can he get the bounce? He waits for it, picks it up. Yes, he's in. And he's proud of the stars and the battles he's fought. Dally. And he struggles and bleeds as he hangs on his cross. And he likes to be known as the angry young man. And it's come down sweetly for a Brisbane try. Elias again. Ella. Kenny. Mortimer. Almost through. Away to Kenny. Lovely pass. Brent Kenny gives it to Mike Lake. Mama who drops it. Who picks it up? Ian French. French gets the halfway. Away to Dale Shearer. David Brooks is going at him. Has he got the pace? He has it. I don't think. It's all over. Brings it in the way. And he's picked up now. I'm sure you'll agree some of the great four-point landings of 1985. Don't go away because in just a few minutes' time, we'll return with the first round of votes in the 1985 Rockman's Gold Medal. And welcome back to the final countdown for the 1985 Rockman's Gold Medal for Rugby League. Now we have the first round of votes, which takes us from the start of the season to the 12th of May. A total of seven fixture matches played by each side. And what an explosive start it was. North's halfback, Jeff Bagnell, has polled the maximum three points on three occasions. In matches against Souths, Winner Manly and Wes, he also polled two two-pointers against Brothers and Redcliffe. And he opens his account with a massive tally of 13. Halfbacks always seem to poll well in best and fairest awards, and the 1985 Rothmans medal is no exception. Three halves caught the referee's eye in the first round. Henry Foster of Brothers, Ross Henrik of Valleys, and North's youngster, Jeff Bagnall. 
the slippery little half in only his second year of senior football, was the driving force behind the Devils' attack in the first round. Always dangerous from the scrum base or from dummy half, and he scored some thrilling individual tries. Strangely enough, he was to end the season playing on the wing, but in the first round, Jeff Bagnall was Brisbane's outstanding halfback, scoring the maximum three points three times and two points twice in seven games, for a tally of 13 points. It goes without saying that Jeff Bagnall has made a sensational start to the 85 season, scoring points in five of the seven matches he played. Also in the first round, South's fullback Gary Belcher polled five votes. Michael Booth, the Valley's custodian, opened with two votes, while Greg Dowling started with three. Tim Dwyer, brother's fullback come centre, commenced with five votes, as did South's John Elias. The halfbacks were certainly in scintillating form early in the season. Brothers number seven, Henry Foster, started with nine votes polling the maximum three points on three occasions in the matches against Wests, Easts and Norths. Rather than confuse the counting, Henry Foster decided he wouldn't stretch the mathematical abilities of the vote counters in round one. He simply decided to pick up three points in each of the first three months of the season. He initiated Brothers' sole try in the match against Wests in March, and when Brothers thrashed Easts on April 24th, even East's president, Ted Berenkamp, was moved to describe Foster's effort as that of a skilled surgeon. The little halfback, who's playing his final season in Brisbane, scored another three-pointer in the State League match against Norths, again being the motivating force behind several of Brothers' tries. And let's hope, uh, Let's hope a little of that famous Strudwick psych can persuade Henry Foster to stay in Brisbane for 1986. And another player who had a mortgage on the three-pointers in the first round, Wynnum and Queensland back rower Ian French, who polled maximum points in the opening three matches of the year to go to nine. <laughs> Peter Griffiths, Redcliffe's front rower, is yet to open his account. But wait for it, yes, another halfback blitzing the opposition at the start of the year, Rossi Hendrick, almost emulates the amazing feats of his north side neighbour, Jeff Bagnell, polling in five of the seven matches, and he has 11 points. The careers of Jeff Bagnell and Ross Hendrick were virtually parallel in 1985, both of them starting superbly and then having to struggle towards the end of the season. Hendrick scored the maximum three points in Valley's win over Norths in March, he also scored two pointers against Wynnum Manley and Easts in the first round. The diehards lost the match against Wynnum, but even then astute observers were forecasting big things for the diehards in 85. At this stage, however, they were on a run of outs, in the process of losing five straight. But the angry ant was always in the fray, scoring a try in the match lost to Easts. So despite playing in a struggling side at that point of the season, Ross Hendrick was obviously proving an inspiration to all around him. Last year's gold medalist, Cavill Hugh, is yet to register votes, while Valley's lock Mark Hone opened with one vote. Brothers winger and fullback Joe Kilroy is yet to open his account. Valley's winger, Les Kiss, opened with three votes. Three votes also went to West, diminutive halfback Kevin Langer. While East Lock, Brett LeMann grabbed attention from the men in the middle with two maximum votes, and he's on six points. In this first round of seven club matches, Wally Lewis opened with three votes. However, North front rower Trevor Lucas hasn't yet troubled the scorer. As we've already explained, Mel Meninga was wowing them overseas at this point, so he's yet to register votes. Though South's teammate Mark Meskell started well, polling four votes, and another prop, Bill Ross from West, started with five. Brothers Lock, Dan Staines, made a start with two votes to conclude the counting after round one. And now, with the help of modern technology, we'll be able to show you the leaderboard as it looks after the first round that included, of course, seven premiership matches here in Brisbane. Jeff Bagnell hasn't bothered to move from his top spot on the board he leads the field with 13 points. And at this stage, it really is a battle of the little men with Ross, Hendri Ross Hendrick on 11, Henry Foster on 9, and the only man to break the halfback's domination is Ian French, also on 9 votes. <laughs> well,
Well, Cavill Hughes set a record point score to win the Rothmans last year, but Jeff Bagnall is doing his very best to upstage Cavill with his amazing start to the 1985 season. And I think, at the moment, he'll probably be in a state of mild shock. Well, Jeff, uh, there's not a lot of you, and I wondered, uh, you had a great start to the season. Did you put in an extra effort during the summer months? Oh, a little bit extra effort, but all our halfbacks do. They're all small, and we've got to do extra weights and sprint training to keep up with these big fellas that try to knock us around. Well, you started halfback, you ended up on the wing. Where are you going to play next year? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, probably back at halfback, I'd say. Well, congratulations on your first round efforts. Thank you, Peter. Pat? Thanks, Peter. Well, the grand final is still six days away. The Rothmans medal, though, is only a few nerve-wracking minutes. With Jeff Bagnell, the man they must all catch, we'll take this commercial break and return to the Crest International Hotel in just a moment. And welcome back to the presentation dinner for the 1985 Rothmans gold medal. The second tally of votes in this year's award features matches from the 26th of May to the 7th of July. This period included the first two State of Origin matches and the Australia versus New Zealand test played at Lang Park. I think I don't think I was mistaken when I spotted Ron McAuliffe twist a little uncomfortably in his chair at the mention of those first two State of Origin games. So Ron, uh, as we look at the highlights of the opening matches in the series, you are excused if you look the other way momentarily. For the first time since its inception in 1980, the State of Origin series was minus Arthur Beetson. He'd either played or coached Queensland during those first five years. But now Des Morris was at the helm, and he was supremely confident of following the Beetson tradition. But in the first match in the mud and slush of Lang Park, no one expected the threat to come from a man who played rugby union for Queensland, Michael O'Connor. He scored all 18 points for the Blues in their comprehensive triumph. For the Maroons, there were still heroes. Not the least of those were Greg Dowling, who polled three points in the match, and John Rebo, the man who'd actually pondered retirement at the start of the season. Rebo was awarded two points for his sterling efforts. The second Origin match before 40,000 parochial Sydney siders looked like going the same way as the first. The Blues dashing away to a 12-0 lead early in the first half. But Wally Lewis had copped a bit of flack after the first match and he was only warming to the task. He inspired a Maroon fight back which saw Queensland get to within one point of the Blues before capitulating in the final moments in what will be remembered as one of the best games ever in this great series. Lewis was awarded two Rothmans points after Queensland was beaten 21 points to 14. Well, we as Queenslanders are naturally disappointed at the result of those first two State of Origin matches, but as the old adage goes, no matter who the victor on that chilly night in Sydney, Rugby League was certainly the winner. Right, back to the serious business of counting the votes from the second round. And, as I've already said, voting was suspended for two matches while the Australian side was in New Zealand. Jeff Bagnell, after such a great start to the season, didn't add to his score and remains at 13. Gary Belcher has collected a further four votes. Now he now moves to nine. Michael Booth was a judge best on the field on two occasions during this round, and he has sped up to eight. Greg Dowling polled a further three votes for that marvellous state of origin effort, and he moves to six. They say a prop forward isn't doing his job if you notice him in the field. And he doesn't exactly turn the other cheek when the going gets tough. So it's remarkable that one of the roughest and toughest props in the game, Greg Dowling, scored any points at all. Even more remarkably, Greg's major award came in the toughest of matches, the first state of origin clash with New South Wales. Even though the Blues won convincingly, the man they call the Wall reveled in the Lang Park slush that night with crushing defence and clever ball handling. When you consider he was out of the game for 18 months with a badly broken leg from the end of the 1981 season, Greg has made a magnificent comeback. Whether it was for Winner Manly, Queensland or Australia, Greg Dowling has been a force to reckon with in 1985. Tim Dwyer really caught the referee's eye in this round, polling in three of the five available matches and increased his score by seven, making his tally now 12. John Elias added a further three points to have eight, 
while Henry Foster slowed his momentum and did not add to his first round total of nine. Ian French picks up a three-pointer in this round and as a measure of his consistency and value to his club Wynnum and his state, Ian has now polled on four occasions since the start of the season to have a tally of 12. Another star in the mighty Seagull pack has been dashing back rower Ian French. Whether playing lock or second row, the long striding forward consistently surprised opponents with his strength and speed. After giving the game away for a season, Ian returned with renewed vigour last year, inspired by the success of brother Brett. After winning the Premiership last season, the Seagulls continued their winning run this year, taking out the Woolies Trophy and the State League titles. And Ian French was a vital cog in the side, taking major points in the first three matches of the season. He went on to make his debut for the State and achieved the rare feat of scoring tries in his first two games against New South Wales. Back inside, it goes to Ian French. Is he over? He is, he's there! An international of the future, Ian French. Peter Griffiths may have started slowly, but he quickly muscles in on the leaderboard to poll six votes. Ross Henrik failed to score in this round and remains on 11, while last year's winner, Cavill Hugh, charged onto the board almost as quickly as he charges onto a hooker's pass, polling in four of the five games, and now has nine votes. Our memories need little jolting to know that Cavill Hugh won last year's Rothmans medal by a record margin. He started this season in mixed fashion, with high praise from his coach, but patchy form. However, in the second round, Easts recorded a memorable 28-12 win over grand finalist Souths. Although Cavill only kicked two out of six, his general play was outstanding. And he picked up two points in the match against Redcliffe on the 7th of July, in what was one of the toughest matches of the year, and kept the Tigers, albeit momentarily, in outright fourth place ahead of Valleys. 30 metres out, moves in, hits it nicely. It's going to curl right between the post. Valley's Mark Hone adds three, three votes in this round and he is now on four. Joe Kilroy opens his account with three votes. And the diehards Les Kiss adds another point to his first round tally and he also is now four. One of the halfbacks who did impress in these matches was Wes Kev Langer. He increases his score by six and now has a total of nine votes. Brett LeMann did not improve, he stays on six. And joining him on that score is the man who wears number six on his back for both Wynnum, Queensland and Australia, Wally Lewis. Yeah. Trevor Lucas from North opens his account with two points and we can expect a barnstorming finish from Big Mel Meninga because he's yet to register a vote. <laughs> Mark Meskell adds one vote and moves to five. Bill Ross is looming as a threat to the leaders. He's improved his tally by three and now has eight votes. And Dan Staines is making steady progress. He goes to five after adding a further three votes. The situation now, to say the least, is intriguing. Let's have a look at the leaderboard after round two. Of course, five matches included in this round. Jeff Bagnell from Norths is still the pace setter. He's got 13 points. But hot on his heels are both Tim Dwyer and Ian French just one point behind. While we keep you in suspense, let's quickly ponder the fate of next Sunday's grand final. At least that's only a two-team race and probably a little easier to select a winner from. Well, Des, uh, for the Seagulls and for yourself, it's a big match on Sunday, but as a coach, this is your sixth grand final in 10 years, but you must have felt there were times during the season, especially on Sunday, when you mightn't have even made it. Yes, Pete, I think we've done it fairly tough over the last uh, three or four weeks, and um, you know, we're very happy to be there, of course, and uh, you know, while we might have been in a few grand finals, the most important one is, on, is the one on Sunday. Well, the man standing next to you uh, is uh, probably wishing he wasn't standing next to you at this moment, Wayne Bennett. Wayne, uh, for Souths, this is a uh, treble, really. The third time that you've had all three senior grades in the grand finals. Congratulations on that. Last year, of course, you were beaten by Wynnum in the major semi and the grand final. But uh, I suppose this weekend you hope you can make it a treble for Souths. We certainly are. I think the difference between this season and last season is the fact that we're playing well at the end of the season. Last year we were struggling. Um, we managed to stay there, but we weren't playing as well as we are now. Well, best of luck to you both on Sunday.
And tonight, Wayne Bennett and Des Morris can relax while the players have the butterflies, but I'm sure they'll have a few of those flooding around in the stomach next Sunday afternoon. Another full round of matches remains to be counted, so any one of those 22 players on our board can still win the Rothmans gold medal. We'll be back after this break to continue the countdown. And welcome back to the final countdown of the Rothmans gold medal for 1985. As we mentioned earlier, Queensland and Australian representative matches played within Australia will count in this year's vote. There's little doubting that the Lang Park clash between Australia and New Zealand was one of the real highlights of the 1985 league calendar. The Test Series against New Zealand will be remembered for two reasons. The Kiwis' bad luck and John Rebo's dream farewell to football. Although Australia won the Series 2-1, they scraped in with a last second try by Rebo in the second Test in Auckland and were comprehensively beaten in the third. The most spectacular and probably the best of the three games was the first at Lang Park. The Kiwis lost their inspiring skipper Mark Graham just after half-time, but still gave the Aussies a fright. The most unlikely-looking footballer of all, the bulky Olsen Filipina, had an absolute blinder, scoring a try, kicking four out of four, and almost blotting out Australia's superstar Wally Lewis. Another underrated Kiwi, winger Dean Bell, scored the best try of the game, sizzling through a gap and swerving around Gary Jack. Gary Jack's missed him. He'll go in and score. Oh, what a brilliant solo try. But it was the veteran John Rebo in his final season who won the hearts of the crowd and the game. First, he finished off a blindside move to score in the corner and then in the last minutes, flashed over in the corner for the winning try. Then he kicked the goal from the sideline to boot, giving Australia a 26-20 victory. The kick's on its way. It looks good. Hits the upright, just shaves it and falls in. Well, even though 1985 hasn't been quite the unbelievably successful year you had in 1984, you did win the Golden Boot Award, for which we give you congratulations and you've had a fine season, but it's hard to accept that last year you didn't even get on the board for the Rothmans. You must be pleased that rep games count this year. Yeah, I think so. I, I can probably understand why I don't get on the, uh, the board too much. I'm in a, a position, uh, you know, I, I certainly do respect the, uh, the referees, but obviously uh, whenever I open my mouth on the field, it gets me into trouble. So, you know, it's just uh, one of the things of the game. Are you reaching peak form for this week's game? Well, I hope so. I haven't had the best of years, but... Uh, you know, I, I hope so for this week for winning Manly's sake. Um, you know, we're in a bit of trouble down there at the moment financially, but, uh, you know, we, we think we can get away with it. We hope so anyway, but uh, we'll certainly be respecting South. Well, we'll enjoy watching you on Sunday. Best of luck. Thank you. But if Wally was wonderful in 85, Rebo was remarkable. The Redcliffe winger seriously pondered retirement before the start of the season. He decided not to and went on to play the full series of State of Origin and Test matches, a fantastic effort by a man who was also motivated a little, I suppose, by the desire to make the critics eat their words once and for all. He says he's definitely donned a club jersey for the last time, but just to cap off a great year, he was given the honour of skippering an Australian side for the anniversary match against Papua New Guinea. Rebo's ability and attitude, I think you'll all agree, epitomises what every youngster should aspire to in this great game, that his efforts haven't gone unrewarded. With lyrics from Wayne Roberts, we've captured some of the great moments of delight he gave to league followers right around the globe. Out on the field Get set for battle Can't make the same mistake this time champions the new generation he is the one who masters the blind and I wonder how he will react to the change looking out to the park and nothing else
to score for Australia. Words by Wayne Roberts, pictures painstakingly put together by Steve Tedman, and all the action provided by John Rebo. We thank the three of them. I'm sure you'll forgive us for straying just momentarily from the real purpose of tonight's gathering. That is, of course, to announce the winner of the 1985 Rothmans Gold Medal. As we quickly refresh your memories on a congested leaderboard, we'll take this short pause and be back with the final votes and the announcement of the winner of the 1985 Rothmans Gold Medalist for Rugby League. Welcome back to the Crest International Hotel and the third round of votes will take us from the 14th of July to the 11th of August. That includes the third State of Origin clash at Lang Park, one which does stick vividly in Ron McAuliffe's memory. Jeff Bagnell may have made his run too early and his tally remains at 13. But Gary Belcher has added five votes and takes his progressive total to 14 and uh, is showing that he really is the Mr. Consistency of the Brisbane competition, scoring well in all three rounds so far. When a manly fullback, Colin Scott, has had a mortgage on the number one jersey for the Queensland team for the past five years, so you wouldn't blame other aspiring custodians looking elsewhere. But South's Gary Belcher has been consistently brilliant for several seasons, and 1985 has been his best year. After suffering a severe head knock against Wynnum in the second round, his future looked in some doubt. But he came back as strong as ever, unflinching under the high ball and brilliant in attack. One of the high points of his season came in the second round match against Wests. Belcher scored four tries in the Magpies' 34-8 demolition of the hapless Panthers and he too polled a nine in Rugby League week. Whilst most players have their good and bad patches throughout the season, Gary Belcher's form has been consistently good, despite the Magpies' fluctuating fortunes. Another fullback, Michael Booth, has increased his tally by one and is now on nine points. Greg Dowling picks up the maximum three points in the last match against East and a further two points in the third State of Origin clash. With those five points, he's raced into double figures and is now on 11. Tim Dwyer is also keeping the statisticians busy. He's added a further six votes and is now the new leader on 18. If consistency is the criterion en route to a Rothmans gold medal, brothers fullback come centre, Tim Dwyer, must surely fit the bill. He's polled in nine matches so far this year, in what can only be described as a superb all-round performance. Tim hit the maximum three points on three occasions so far, including the super tough match against Easts at Corbett Park last month, which brothers clinched only in the final moments. However, like Henry Foster, he was consistent, polling at least one three-pointer in every round of voting. John Elias did not improve in this round and remains on eight. Henry Foster's charge has also petered out a little. He stays on nine. But Ian French is now the man they all must catch. He polled votes in four of the five available matches to increase his tally by seven votes and grabs the lead away from Timmy Dwyer with 19 points. <laughs> Peter Griffiths adds three votes and he goes to nine. And the halfbacks must have decided to go on strike in this round because like Henry Foster, Rossi Hendrick has also failed to add further points. He remains on 11. Cavill Hugh did not increase his tally. He stays on nine. Mark Hone was starting to make his presence felt in the diehards lineup. He moves up to seven after adding three in this round. Joe Kilroy moves to fullback and also moves up the board, taking five votes to give him a total of eight. Kilroy is proving a real inspiration to brothers, but the semis not all that far away. Unsettled. That's probably the best way to describe Joe Kilroy's start to the 1985 season. But his undoubted brilliance has found him a permanent spot as brothers fullback towards the latter part of the season. And it was then only that Kilroy started to attract attention, not only from supporters, but referees as well. He picked up two two-pointers in a row against Norths and Wests. And against Norths, he scored what must have been the best individual try of the year from the very kickoff.
His three-pointer came against Valleys on the 28th of August when he scored three tries and had a hand in another. In Rugby League week, he polled one of the few nine votes of the year. Obviously, the referees agree. And here's another try with three coming up to Joe Kilroy. Les Kiss also found favour with the referees for one match, picking up two points and is now on six. One of the halfbacks who continued to impress was Kevin Langer, scoring three points in the round and pressing ahead to 12. Brett LeMann also added three points and he goes to nine. Wally Lewis didn't improve in this round, he stays on six. And obviously playing superb football towards the latter part of the season is North's Trevor Lucas. He picks up a hefty eight points for the round and is now on ten points. Mel Meninga finally opens his scoring with a two-pointer. And Mark Meskell, also from South, picks up six and goes to 11. But Bill Ross failed to add to his tally. He stays on eight. Dan Staines is moving along steadily. He grabs three points and he too is on eight. So that concludes the third round of voting. Number the five matches tallied there. The votes now for round three tally that leaves the leaderboard in somewhat of this configuration. Winham's Ian French is the new front runner. He's on 19 points. Tim Dwyer is desperately close on 18, and Gary Belcher has moved into third spot with 14 points. Tim Dwyer, in this age of the bomb, do you really prefer fullback to playing centre? Uh, Peter, it doesn't really worry me too much. Um... I enjoy both positions and I fit in, into both positions pretty well, I think, this year. Well, I'll agree with that. In 17 years of the Rothmans medal, no Brothers player has ever won it. Do you think this year could be the year? This could be the year, Peter. Um, we're feeling confident and uh, we just take for the best, that's all. Well, best of luck to you and to Brothers. Thanks very much, Peter. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Peter. Back to you, Pat. Well, the exciting climax to the 1985 Rothmans gold medal is now just a few moments away. But to soothe those nerves, let's quickly recall Queensland's solitary but unforgettable moment of glory in the 1985 State of Origin series. It is, of course, the Maroons' comprehensive thrashing of the Blues in the final match at Lang Park. The third and final State of Origin game for 1985 was something of an anti-climax, as New South Wales had already clinched the series. But it was still memorable for several reasons, especially from a Queensland point of view. Whilst it marked the end of the careers of winger John Rebo and QRL chairman Ron McAuliffe, it also heralded the start of a new era, with brilliant performances by new boys Ian French and Dale Shearer. The flying Shearer scored two tries, showing class beyond his years. The first, when he followed a kick by Colin Scott and with clever judgment and blistering pace, careered away to score. He waits for it, picks it up. Yes, he's in. The second, when he followed a break by the speedy French to street the cover defence down the Berkstown touchline. Mortimer, almost through. Away to Kenny, lovely pass. Brett Kenny gives it to Michael O'Connor, who drops it. Who picks it up? Ian French. French gets to halfway, away to Dale Shearer. David Brooks is coming at him. Has he got the pace? He has it, I don't think. It's all over. Queensland have won. They won't pick him up now. The long-striding Ian French, who scored a try in his debut in the second State of Origin match, did it again at Lang Park. Ian French, French going for the line. They won't stop him. Whilst these players shone an attack, it was the crunching defence of Wally Fullerton-Smith that earned him the Man of the Match award. And for a finale, it was hard to beat the now traditional try in the corner by the crowd favourite, John Rebo. Queensland as quickly as he could. Lovely pass. Out wide it goes to Tony Curry. Curry fires it away to Rebo. Rebo will sprint away and score. They won't catch him. Allen dives. Can't get him. Well, with the atmosphere here at the Crest International Hotel very tense indeed, we'll take this commercial and return to name the Rothmans gold medal winner. <laughs> Welcome back now to the final tense moments of the countdown to the Rothmans gold medal. At this point, each team has two matches to play. A maximum of six points can still be scored by any player, so you don't need to be Einstein to work out that only one of the top four players can still be the Rothmans gold medalist for 85. I would like to point out, in the event of a tie at the end of vote counting, 
and the player pulling the highest number of maximum three points will then be named the winner of the Rothmans gold medal. I would like now to invite the chairman of the Queensland Rugby League, Mr Ron McAuliffe, a man who has done so much for the code in this state, to come forward with Mr Des Hancock and the incumbent chairman of the QRL, Mr Bill Hunter, join me on stage for the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, to read those final crucial votes to decide the Rothmans gold medalist for 1985, I have great pleasure in introducing to you the chairman of the QRL, Mr Ron McAuliffe. Ladies and gentlemen, before I do what I've been called to the platform to do, and that's to announce the winner of the Rothman Medal for 1985, may I have your indulgence for just a few minutes. Next Friday, in the boardroom of the Queensland Rugby League, I step down officially as the chairman of that body after 33 years. And I know it's in good hands uh, with Alderman Bill Hunter. I do so with a lot of satisfaction because if one was able to have a panorama of all the events that happened in that 33 years, one could feel smugly happen, uh, happy because a lot of them were shown on the screen here this evening. I have one message for our competitors who say rugby league is slipping. Well, if it is, it's slipping in the right direction. And I hope it keeps on going. There. Now to return to what I, it is my honour to do this evening, and that is to open this envelope very nervously too, and announce the thing you're all waiting for. In announcing the winner of the Rothmans Gold Medal for Rugby League in 1985, you can see from the leader of the board that the focus is on four players. Keeping in mind that a maximum of six points. I might depart from the script, <laughs> put you all at ease and say the winner let me make doubly sure, <laughs> is Ian French. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I think first of all I'd like to thank Rossmans for the continued support in league. I'd also also like to thank DJ and the boys. Without them I don't think I would have won it. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Ian, before you go, I think the applause was so deafening they might not have heard it, but uh, Ian, on behalf of uh, everybody who's here, congratulations. Uh, it's been a great year for you, not only as uh, a winner Manly player, as a Queensland player to have uh, made you debut for Queensland and to score a try in the first two matches in which you played, but to win this award, uh, the most prestigious award you can win in rugby league, uh, which has been the highlight so far this year? I don't know, I just don't believe this yet. <laughs> I you, don't know. You nearly gave the game away, didn't you? No, I did there for a while, but I came back and I'm glad I did. Well, we're certainly glad you did. You've got one more job to do on Sunday. I sure have, yeah. Congratulations, Ian French. Thanks, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to Ian French I'm for the Rothmans medal victory tonight. Possibly he could make it two in a row come Sunday afternoon around 4.30. That concludes our telecast of the 1985 Rothmans gold medal for rugby league. Certainly hope you've enjoyed it. Personally, I would like to thank 
Peter Mears, congratulate our winner, Ian French, and thank the entire Channel 7 sports crew that have worked on it tonight, particularly producer-director John Olmsby, who put a lot of hours into putting this telecast to air. This is Pat Welch on behalf of the entire 7 sport team, bidding you a very good evening. Next on 7, it's the latest in news events from around the world with News World followed by 7 National News Overnight. Hello, Glenn Taylor. And next on State Affair, we report on a breakthrough cure for ulcers. That's on State Affair at 6.30.